Welcome you this evening into Bethany Church located in Columbia, Illinois for Maundy Thursday. The word Maundy simply means commandment. A commandment is a directive given by God or Jesus Christ. The dominant commandment is love this evening and it's centered around a very special meal called Holy Communion or set apart meal. It's good to be together this evening. We welcome you in online. We welcome you those of you who are here in the sanctuary as we gather in the depths of Holy Week. We're going to receive communion in just a couple of moments. 
Those who are online can gather together bread or crackers, juice or drink to represent the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And then for those gathered here in the sanctuary at the table up front, you're welcome to pick up a small communion cup that has a wafer and a juice contained in a sealed package. So we will do that shortly. Back in the first century, Jesus was pouring himself out to his followers as well as to the crowds in general. And on one particular night, he wanted to have a meal with his followers and with those who had ears to hear and eyes to see. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread first, lifted it up, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he lifted up the cup and pronounced a brand new teaching for everyone to hear. This is my blood poured out for you and for many other people. Drink this as often as you drink this in remembrance of me. And so mindful that God is always looking for our response, we prepare ourselves to receive communion this evening, either online or on site, mindful of the love, the forgiveness, and the redemption that God and Jesus Christ provide to us at a time such as this. And we receive it this time. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ, both are given for us. Amen. As we continue in this time together, I want to invite you to stand. As we prepare to receive the scripture this evening, please stand. Scripture this evening will come from Matthew chapter 26 with a description of what's called the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, or the Eucharist. Let's prepare to receive God's word. From deep in the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, we find these words. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him the teacher says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? Is it I? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. On the way, Jesus told them, 
tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It is the time of the Passover. Passover is the time for the people to remember that God has delivered them out of Egypt, or God has delivered their ancestors out of Egypt. Passover is celebrated in Jerusalem. It happens once a year, and people travel from all over the area, right outside of Jerusalem, and from far-flung parts all around the Mediterranean Sea Basin, as well as the entire world, and they travel to Jerusalem for Passover. It's kind of like traveling from Hecker, Cisna Park, Ransom, Buckner, Collison, and coming to the Metro East or to nearby St. Louis. Welcome to Passover. Thank you for being here both online and in sanctuary. The big ideas tonight flash on the wall or on the screen. The betrayal of Jesus, Judas Iscariot. In remembrance of Jesus, what's called the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the body and the blood. People in their faith forever changed. Some will stumble in their faith with Jesus. They will walk away from the sun and when it all falls apart. Matthew 26, verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover supper? A.T. Olmsted from Ages Pass locates Maundy Thursday on Thursday, of course, April the 6th in the year 30. The year 30 in the first century. That's disputed, of course. Verses 18 and 19. As you go into the city, Jesus tells them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples do as Jesus tells them and prepare the Passover supper there. Jesus says to the disciples, prepare the Passover meal, and the disciples simply prepare the Passover meal. Or Bible scholars claim that women prepared the meal and handed it to the disciples. I'm just the messenger. You'll have to decide. But in the flurry of all the Passover preparations, Jesus looks right at people's hearts and going deeper in the depths of the season of Lent, Jesus looks inside of people's hearts. It's what he's doing during this dinner. Verses 20 and 21. When it was evening, Jesus sits down at the table with the 12 disciples. While they are eating, he says, the truth is, one of you will betray me. Verse 22, greatly distressed, one by one, the disciples begin to ask Jesus, is it I, Lord? I'm not the one. Am I, Lord? Jesus says, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me while we are eating a meal together. All of the disciples must be thinking, for the love of God, Peter, don't say anything. Don't speak. Let's see what Jesus is getting at. You talk about a showstopper and a supper stopper. Everybody must practically choke on their food all at the same time or something like that. And each of the disciples rolls it around in their mind. Is it I, Lord? Am I the one that's going to disobey and betray the Lord Jesus Christ? Who's in trouble? Who's going to do it? Is it Peter, Lord? Tell us. Is it Peter? You know they're thinking that. Is it I, Lord? Words that we can posit at Jesus. Why? Because we are not perfect. 
There's a newsflash as we approach the glory of Easter that we are human, we are finite and limited, and we are sinful and we're glorious and marvelous and all these wonderful things wrapped up together. And in in the midst of all that, we are not perfect. I know it comes as a shock. We live in a fallen world. If you don't believe me, just spend some time on the news or social media for five or ten minutes beyond clever things that people say or pictures of animals or those kinds of things where it just goes downhill in a hurry. There are sinful people and there are sinful urges and tendencies because we live in a fallen world because of original sin. Going back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, where Adam and Eve are in the garden and everything is as fine and dandy as long as they're in the garden and doing everything that God says It's when they disobey and they're tempted by Satan wrapped wrapped around a snake around a tree saying you will be just like God if you eat this fruit. And then you know the story, the blame game. Adam blames Eve, he blames Adam, they blame the snake, they blame the circumstances, they blame the garden. And long story short, we live in a fallen world, amen? There's a problem. We need a savior. We cannot save ourselves. Enter Jesus. And then it's going to become clearer as we go through the Scripture. All we are like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned to our own way. Is it I, Lord? That's a powerful phrase to say at this point in the season of Lent. Verses 23 to 25. Jesus lets the people stew in it a little bit, and then he answers, One of you eating with me now will betray me. For I, the Son of Man, must die, as the Scriptures declare long ago. But how terrible it'll be for my betrayer. It would be better that that person hadn't been born in the first place. Judas, the one who would betray him, also says, Teacher, is it I? I'm not the one, am I? And Jesus told him, You have said it yourself. Big idea comes. The betrayer of of Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot. Iscariot means the assassin. Meet Judas the assassin. You ever been at a dinner where it gets awkward? Where someone just says something really strange or weird or off the wall? We're talking something off the wall that rivals Cousin Eddie? Well, awkward dinner, the dinner participants power on and they keep eating. And the argument could be made because they don't have the sensibilities or the um, sensitivity of other people to where they just keep eating, and it's a bunch of men. This probably isn't how any of the disciples saw the dinner going. Save Judas. Save Judas, that's kind of ironic, isn't it? There will be no saving of Judas. He is Jesus' betrayer. It's bad for Judas, really bad. Whether Judas realizes it yet in this moment or not, His life is over, finished. The saying goes that no one says that there's a church named St. Judas. Have you found one yet? Could you imagine getting a phone call from someone? We'd like to invite you to our Easter celebration this Sunday at St. Judas something something church. Yeah, me either. Judas is an outsider. And his friend Simon the Zealot is an outsider. They're not from Galilee. All the other disciples hail from Galilee. So we can look at Judas and rope in Simon the Zealot and do a St. Louis thing. Where are you from? You ain't from around here. Well, it's just kind of old school. You see, together, Judas and Simon the Zealot expect completely different things out of Jesus than the other disciples. They expect Jesus to lead the charge to get rid of the Romans once and for all, to send them packing for good, never to come back or even think about Jerusalem. Ah, but we know Jesus is a different kind of king with a different kind of kingdom. Some argue that his throne was the cross. He's on the cross, and then later he's off the cross, and that Jesus dies for other people, for their benefit, that he dies for the forgiveness of their sins. Unheard of in the ancient world. It's an inside job to upend Jesus. Judas has gone to the chief priest in front of our scripture to set the betrayal in motion, and Judas literally sells out Jesus. And the price, 30 pieces of silver, the same amount of money to purchase a slave. Satan has filled Judas. Evil takes hold. Walk away from the sun, come slowly undone. Walk away from the sun, come slowly undone. And you're fading with every day. Who knew Sean Morgan had it right? Front man of Seether. 
Judas is filled with evil. And on top of that, he steals money and he steals a lot of money. And the ministry of Jesus Christ has taken a hit. The question is posed, what kind of person steals money from Jesus? Will the ministry recover? Meanwhile, the disciples continue to eat, even though it's very awkward and unpleasant and bizarre. Have you ever powered your way on, keep eating in a really uncomfortable situation and think it's going to get better? We'll read on. Verses 26 to 28. As they eat, Jesus takes a loaf of bread, asks God's blessing on it, then he breaks it in pieces and gives it to the disciples, saying, take and eat, for this is my body. And he takes a cup of wine and gives thanks to God for it. He gives it to them and says, Each of you drink from this, for this is my blood, which seals the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out to forgive the sins of many. The big idea in remembrance of Jesus, we gather for the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread, the shedding and the sharing, the blood. Holy Communion in the ancient world was a full course meal. Till about the second or third century, you'd have your starter, a cup of wine. You would have your bread, and a cup of wine. Eat your main dish, a cup of wine, fruit and vegetable, olives, figs, dates, and um, grapes were the, the, the vital foods in the ancient world. Cup of wine, kind of like our bean and um, soybeans, corn, and um, what's the other thing that we eat around here a lot? Corn and the other thing, I can't think of it, but you get the idea. It's an Illinois thing. Um, and then dessert, cup of wine. And so people that had the means would have these dinners. And they would lounge at the table to take up like two spots where you would typically sit like at a table or a booth or something like that. And you would just enjoy the dinner. But it's so unpleasant. And it's so awkward. And there are painful things that have been shared that Jesus is going to betray. We know who the betrayer is. And then Jesus is giving teaching on top of that. And the wine is flowing through each course of the meal. And then there's an extra cup of wine with the idea that Elijah may come and enjoy any dinner at any time. Because as you remember the story of Elijah or read it in the Old Testament, he doesn't even die. He rides away in a chariot being whisked off to heaven. And so the thinking is Elijah could come back and so that there is a cup of wine reserved for a guest of honor named Elijah in case he's coming to dinner. Talk about one upping eager Peter if that were to happen. And now the Lord's Supper focuses solely on Jesus Christ. We teach briefly in our membership class, what is the Lord's Supper? And the story unfolds in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, elsewhere in the Bible. The Lord's Supper is a sacred act. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is symbolic of the new covenant. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it to remember me. It's a proclamation of faith. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the benefits of the blood of Christ? And when we break the loaf of bread, aren't we sharing in the benefits of the body of Christ? When we share in Holy Communion, our next big idea comes into play. People and their faith are forever changed. And like we teach in our membership class, Jesus is present with us at Holy Communion, offering us the cleansing of sin, the healing of the body, spiritual refreshing and renewal, and a strengthening for the living of each and every day. In other words, times where we receive communion are a time to kind of recenter and reset and focus on Jesus Christ, and recharge and strengthen and embolden ourselves. What about children? United Methodist Church is an open table, always has been. All of us need to be preparing to commune with Jesus. What about children? They can come anytime. Let the parents decide. The people are given the information. Children can receive communion at any time. How often should we take communion? As often as we can, exclamation point. Communion is a special means of grace by which the Lord draws near to us to strengthen us in our faith. Pandemic or no pandemic. In our United Methodist Church, there are some good resources that come in handy from time to time, including this prayer that has heritage and tradition in the church at a time of communion. 
A prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We haven't loved our neighbors. We haven't heard the cry of the needy. Free us, we pray, for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I would add that the Lord's Supper releases the power of love, the power of forgiveness, and the power of redemption. Just about this time in our lives and in our history and in our mortality, don't we need a little love, forgiveness, and redemption? This is 29 and 30. Jesus says, mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. There's a little bit of time to breathe. What did they sing? People believe they sang something between Psalm 115 to Psalm 118, including a variation of these words. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. Have you heard those words before? That's the start of a song. That's Psalm 118, where people are released from this awkward dinner, strange, weird, awkward, off-the-wall dinner, and they are singing, and they're focusing on the Lord God Almighty, that the love endures forever, and it's going to have to endure, because things are going to get worse. Jesus continues to teach, verse 31, Tonight all of you will desert me, for the Scriptures say I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock, will be scattered. Big idea, some will stumble in their faith with Jesus. They will walk away from the sun. Jesus says this is happening like soon, like tonight, you are going to be gone away from me. To echo some vintage concrete blonde, they don't know who to run to. They don't know where to go. Unless you tell them what to think, they don't know what to know. The sheep are running scared tonight with Jesus' proclamation that the sheep are going to be scattered Elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus has said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Have you heard that before? And in the meantime, the disciples struggle. And 20 verses later in Scripture, all the disciples desert Jesus, and they're on the run. Matthew 26, verse 32, Jesus says, But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. So in the midst of this awkward, strange, weird, off-the-way dinner party where there's an incredible uh, betrayal of historic proportions, Jesus says, I'm going to be raised from the dead, and I'm going to meet you in Galilee. Spoiler alert, Jesus is coming back, and he will see you in Galilee, like a sweeping area that may or may not have grain elevators or water towers, where some of the people are decent and upstanding, and others are engaged in like the wild, wild west, as Galilee was described in the ancient world. Is that part of the world? It was the wild, wild west, where there was tomfoolery and robberies and bandits and all kinds of crime and problems. And Jesus says, after I rise up, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. Jesus will return. Peter interrupts the flow. Doesn't Peter do that all the time? Verse 33 is fascinating. Peter happens. Peter declares, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never leave you. Oh, Peter. Loose translation here. Peter's saying, I'm not like everybody else here. I'm better than everybody else. I'm the smartest one in the room. I'm the, the most resilient Jesus. We're talking like North St. Louis resilient Jesus. I will never desert you. You can always count on me. Peter will be in a world of hurt very soon. Verses 34 and 35. Jesus intently looks at Peter and says, The truth is this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. No, Peter insists, not even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vow the same. I bet. Big idea, when it all falls apart. Elsewhere in Scripture, John 6, 66, reports that at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. They ghost Jesus. Gone. Walk away from the sun Come slowly undone. It doesn't have to be that way. Take the big ideas with you tonight. The betrayal of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, the assassin. In remembrance of Jesus, there is the meal known as the Lord's Supper with the body 
and the blood. People in their faith are forever changed. Some will stumble in their faith with Jesus. They will walk away from the sun and when it all falls apart. But a glimmer of hope in the midst of this awkward, weird, strange, off-the-wall dinner where there's betrayal of historic proportions is when it all falls apart, there is still Jesus, whether Jesus is maligned or glorified or somewhere in between. There is always Jesus. But the question for all of us tonight, including me, is, is there us? Are we with Jesus? Let us pray. Walk away from the sun, come slowly undone. We are reminded, Lord God, through your word as well as through uh, remarkable people of faith like our retired pastor, Reverend Gary Mosman, to keep a laser beam focus, to keep a laser sharp focus on Jesus. It can be hard sometimes, God, but help us in our weakness to find a way where there's a nudge or a ping or a shove to focus on you like we do in this time of gathering now, receiving communion, singing, engaging in prayer, and attending to your word and how it speaks to us this night. We do give thanks, Lord God, for the ministry of your son, Jesus, how he holds out again and again without stopping, without giving up the power of love, the power of forgiveness, the power of redemption. In the midst of betrayal, or arrogance, or someone thinking that they're better than others, looking at you, Peter. We're mindful that you are present with us, that you love us, and you are with us. Help us, Lord God, to love and to forgive and to redeem. And help us by you, O God, to be loved, forgiven, and redeemed. For sometimes, truly, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Thanks be to God, there is a shepherd who watches over us and cares for us. May we draw near to him this night and as we go into this Easter weekend. We give thanks for you and your presence in our life. Now mindful that God has always taught us to look for a response. We pray the words of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. and Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Maundy Thursday, for Commandment Thursday, as it is at Bethany Church in Columbia, Illinois. We invite you to worship with us again this coming Sunday morning at 10 a.m. You can check in at 9.55 online on computer or Facebook, those kinds of things, as well as meet here in the church at 10 a.m. And then inside the sanctuary on um, on Easter Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we will have an Easter egg hunt. But until that time of gathering, thank you so much for being here for worship and receive the last song from our praise band.
Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon on Easter Sunday. And as you're ready, we will exit out the side door.